Crossway Church on sanctification. And uh, the Lord is stirring me and leading me to move in this avenue towards sanctification because it is why we, by the Spirit of the Lord, have begun to experience faith in the cross again. Not just to see a harvest reaped, the law saved, but to see a church learning how to live for God. Because there cannot be a harvest without a revival in the hearts of God's people. Now the Bible doesn't teach a big revival in the last days. The Bible really mentions a departing from the faith. And, there, and Jesus said only few would be that find this way. But here's what we know just by being normally uh, 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 intelligent a little bit. That if people are going to, if there's going to be a harvest, then there's got to be a revival. Because it's only the revived who are out there reaping the harvest. The dead church ain't out there reaping nothing. And the only part of the church that's alive is the church that has their faith in the right object. That means Jesus and what he did at Calvary. That brings life. It brought life initially. It brings life daily. And in and, and, and this message about sanctification, the message of the cross, we, the church didn't even really know what sanctification meant. And none of us understand it like we're going to by the time this teaching's over. We know what it is, and we can all write down a short sentence. Well, it's, it's now what we're believing to get us through. And Yeah, that's true. That we're believing the same thing that got us in to get us through every day. And that's really ultimately, that is sanctification. But there's a lot the Bible has to say about sanctification. And we need to learn these things. Jesus said if you're following him, you're learning. If you're not learning the truth, you're not following Jesus. Now that's a, that's a scary thought right there because I know lots of people ain't learned a thing in 30 years. And I know they hadn't learned anything because they're not telling anybody anything see that's that's the result of learning you are telling amen this faith is to be kept all right but not to yourself and whatever we're learning we're telling we're sharing amen a faith that's not being shared is a make-believe faith you need to grab a hold of that a faith that's not worth sharing is a make-believe faith Amen. So sanctification, uh, we're going to learn over the next few uh, services, and, and we'll dig in Friday morning here on the live broadcast on Crossline Television. But sanctification is, is really what Jesus became to us. It's one of the four things that he was made unto us that within those four things we read about in 1 Corinthians 1.30 encompasses everything we will ever need from him. He was made unto us righteousness, redemption, wisdom, and sanctification. Within those four things is everything you and I will ever need. Ever. It includes our standing before God, our provision that we need from God, everything. And sanctification is the one we're going to be talking about because it is how our life goes right now till we meet Him in the clouds. And see, that's what's important. It, it's okay to talk about the rapture and the second coming of Christ and, and to share the word on that. But I'm going to tell you what, that's a given. What's not a given is that we're going to live this life like we ought to. He is coming. The church is going to get raptured. But the question is, are you, go, are you going to live for him in the way that you should until that time? Because it's during this time that we have an opportunity to lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven. It's during this time that we're being shown faithful in the small things that one day we'll be made ruler over much things. Hallelujah. Right now, it counts more than any other time. And what counts is how we're living for God. How we're living for God. You've got to know how to live for God. And you ask the church that and they start Naming things the Bible says to do. Well, you got to go to church. you got to read your Bible. We're not talking about what the Bible says to do. We're talking about how do I do that. Because, man, I've always had a problem in years past trying to start reading the Bible. I remember as a teenager, God be stirring my heart, and I'd start reading the Bible. About a week later, I'd be done. Whatever I wanted to do for God, about a week later is all it took. If it took that long, I'd be done we got to know how to do this, how to live for God. And if we learn how, then we're going to find out, man, it's unending. 
It's unending. This thing's not phased. So many people say, yeah, I used to go to church. Got so many Christians that phased through the church, period. Phased through Bible reading. Phased through doing something for God. And now they are no longer because they didn't know how. If you don't know how, you'll quit. If you don't know how, you'll quit. Guaranteed. If you don't know how to live for God, you are going to get mad at Curtis or somebody looked at you wrong and you're going to quit. So, Lord, teach us how to live. Teach us how to walk. Teach us how to behave. Teach us, Lord, how to have our conversation around. Teach us, Lord, about this sanctification that you were made unto us. Teach us, Lord, what your word says about sanctification. Teach us, oh God, what we need to know. Help us to learn, Lord. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, I just believe he's going to. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where I want to begin this. And Now, if you missed part 1, you need to go back and listen to that. We were in the book of Joshua, a, a great example of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and us being uh, crucified and buried with him and raised in newness of life by faith. And how many of you remember Sunday morning? Uh, uh, Egypt represents... You being born again, coming out of sin by the blood, and then coming out in the wilderness, and God wants you to keep trusting him that way. See, this thing called Christianity, God wants to increase. And he's done that with man ever since he created man. Ever since he began to speak to man that promise in the garden, then he just built on it. One thing after the other. And, and what he was trying to do was get them to see the lights getting brighter. The light's getting brighter until he flipped the switch wide open on a hill called Calvary. I'm talking about the light can't get no brighter than that day on the hill. The light came fully on. There was no more types and shadows. He flipped it wide open. It got so bright on that hill that day, it got dark in the natural. You ever thought about that? It got so bright in the spirit. That devils ran. It got so bright in the spirit that the clouds came and got dark in the natural. And everything God's done is about increase. He wants more for you. Everything, wherever you are, he wants you, you to abound and move forward and more. People who are stagnant just can't break loose and move forward, then they're not in the process of sanctification. They're in a rut. They're in a rut. And it's because they're refusing to obey God, to submit, surrender, consecrate, humble themselves. I know we preach tough messages, but I got news for you. We're tough-headed people. Hard heads. God still loves us, and he's still going to give us the truth. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians 4. They came out of Egypt. I didn't finish that. Bo, you interrupted me again. They come out, I'm just kidding, they come out of Egypt, that represented our being born again. Then they were out in the wilderness, and, and they were in the wilderness for all those years because God wanted to bring them into the promised land, and, and almost all of them wouldn't believe it. You see, you and I are still required to believe God. If you keep moving forward, you've got to believe God to move forward. And it has to be your faith remaining in the cross, in the blood, in the laid down life of the Lamb. Every day, taking up your cross daily, Jesus said. If you're going to move forward, you can't move forward without a cross. Hallelujah. And when they got to the Jordan after that whole generation had died that didn't, the Bible says in Hebrews, didn't believe God. And many Christians over the last, ain't no telling how long, have lived miserable, miserable wilderness lives and died in that condition. Yes, I believe they made heaven, but they lived miserable lives. And, and, and they lived in the wilderness and they died in the wilderness. But thank God there's a generation, there is some people who made it through all that unbelief and now they stand at the Jordan and it's time to go across. And this speaks of sanctification. And crossing, crossing the Jordan is, a, is the crossing you go into the promised land, the land of the promise where you begin to experience the blessings Christ died to give you. Now let me say this before we ever get there. When they crossed the river, the enemy was in the river, out of the side of the river. So we'll get to all that later. But I want you to know, just because you crossed the Jordan, just because you got saved, just because you, 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 your faith is still in the blood, don't mean that they're not enemies coming to get you. 
the Gergeshites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Backbites, and all the bites out there. They coming after you if you're living right. But Joshua took 12 stones in the Jordan and piled up a heap there, and they were going to stay there, and they were the wilderness stones. And he had 12 men, one man from each tribe, take 12 other stones out of the Jordan and put them on the, on the victory side of the river. We're going through. And, and he said, now when your children ask you what these stones mean, you can tell them the Lord, the, the, the waters were stopped by the ark. Not the priests, not the people. The ark is what held the waters up because the ark was God's presence. That's where God dwelt, and we covered that Sunday morning. So it's a beautiful story, and we even mentioned that Jesus is our rock, our cornerstone, stood in that very Jordan, baptized by John the Baptist as our rock, which was symbolic of what he would do at Calvary. His ministry started with a picture of what he would do at Calvary. He would die, he would be buried, he would be raised up. And guess what happened when he came out of that Jordan? The same thing that happened to the children of Israel when they crossed, temptation begins. Jesus, when he came up out of that Jordan, he went, he was carried by the Spirit to be tempted. When we crossed the Jordan, when God brought us out of sin, he, 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 he saved us from a, a kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light that we might show forth the praises of the one who called us, who saved us. And when you're doing that, you're living that, the enemy's coming for you. Amen. Same thing happened to Jesus, happened to the people of Israel, it happened to you. We read those stories because they're an example for us, for our learning. Amen. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, part 2 of sanctification out of the wilderness and into the land of promise. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now this is Paul talking, and notice he tells them by what authority he's speaking to them. By Jesus Christ. By the Lord Jesus. Do you get that tonight? He's not just an apostle, he's an apostle of God, and Jesus has taught him and told him what he's to say. That's powerful. Folks today trying to write Paul, his writings off. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to see it even thicker here in a minute, that what Paul said, Jesus told him to say. I still believe that. They can run and they can... Write a whole nother version. I don't need another version. I don't need a new King James version. I don't need an NIV. I got a Bible right here. I, it don't need to be changed. But look, he says, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God so you would abound more and more. Can we just stop right there and say, if you learn how to walk, God will be pleased. And it's, it's, just, it, it's a mandate that you will be in a place of abounding. If we learn to walk the way we should, how we should walk, if we learn to do that, then God is pleased and we're abounding. Not in the gold and silver, we're abounding in our walk with God. You see, I... I just love where we are right now. And I ain't talking about this building. I'm talking about where we are right now, learning that it's really learning now that it's not about silver and gold. It's about abounding right now in the things of God. That's what we want to abound in. Because if you're abounding in that, God's taking care of everything you'll ever need. He said, if you seek me and my kingdom, my righteousness first, I'll add everything to you. And the church is out there trying to scratch each other's eyes out to get what they need. Suing everybody, talking bad about everybody to try to work their way into some spot or whatever. And God's already promised, just like he promised Israel, that's your land. Go take it. And all we had to do was keep believing what got them out of Egypt, what got them across the Jordan. It's always been just that one thing, that one object of faith, if I might add, the blood. As long as we keep our faith there, we're going to walk right, God's going to be pleased, and we're going to be abounding. If we're not abounding, it's because we're not walking right. Amen. If we're stuck in a rut, we're not walking right. 
And I hear the devil. I hear, I hear him talking in here all the time. Well, we're not all the same. We're not all, can't be like him, can't be like her. We're not all the same. We're all different places. And those are all factual comments the devil makes. But if you're not abounding, your walk is not found pleasing to God. If you're not abounding in your walk, then your walk is not pleasing to God. It's time to rise up tonight on this Wednesday night. Forget next Sunday. Forget last Sunday. Right where you are now, rise up and walk. Keep your faith in the blood of Jesus. The devil's going to tell you, you ain't got to think about that all the time. Every time I even hear that thought, I just start saying, thank you for the blood. Thank you for what you did for me at Calvary. I hear those thoughts, and I'm just going to say what the apostle Paul did by the Spirit of God. I'm going to boast in the cross again today. I'm going to bask in your glory because of the blood. I don't, when I hear those thoughts, I'm just going to enter on in. See, I can be as belligerent as the devil. Look at this now, that as you have received of us, and Paul's already given them the authority by which he speaks. We beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. He said, Jesus the one got us here. We're here on a mandate from Christ. I want you to know we're in this region on a mandate from Christ. Crossline TV has a mandate to reach places they'll never set their feet. But the gospel will reach it. <laughs> that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. Stop right there. Every time you see the word please and God in the same sentence, that means there's got to be faith. And, and, and because it's impossible to please him without faith, that means our walk has to be one of faith. And there can't be faith without the word because faith comes by hearing the word. So we have to be walking according to the word of God so that faith will be right and God can be pleased and we can abound. So the question is, how? How? Because he tells us here, Paul, come tell him, we've already taught you, taught you how you ought to walk and to please God so that you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, we need to talk about that too. We ain't under no commandments. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are under commandments. If you're a Christian tonight and you're under commandments by Jesus that Jesus gave Paul for you to read and believe and walk thereby. Amen. We don't exalt Paul, we exalt the Lord Jesus who gave Paul what he wanted us to have. Just like we don't exalt the prophets of old, we don't exalt Paul the apostle, we exalt the one who sent him. And I value what the one who sent him said through him. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. Even your, and every time you see the word even, just go ahead and scratch it out and put specifically. For this is the will of God, specifically your sanctification. That you should abstain from fornication. Now, when we hear the word fornication, we just all automatically go to sexual sin. But there is more than sexual sin, there is spiritual sin. And when you dig this out, you'll find out it means idolatry. It does mean sexual immorality. But here it means anything your faith is in outside of the cross. Because you can't walk up right before the Lord without that. You can't, God can't be pleased without your walk being one in Christ, in the truth. Amen. So what fornication really is talking about here is spiritual adultery. How many of you know you sinned before you go get drunk? Because you sinned when you wanted to go get drunk. That's what Jesus taught. You didn't, you didn't commit the sin when you went and had adultery with that person. You committed the sin when you wanted to, when you thought about it. The, see, that, that goes back to what we teach here from this pulpit, that God sees what your heart speaks not your lips our hearts speak different sometimes than our lips but God only hears 
the heart's words. We hear each other's verbal words. God hears our hearts speaking. It's like Sunday morning when I made that comment about Christians that say, I just can't live for God. That's what we hear verbally. God hears this. I don't believe you. That's what God hears the heart saying. I don't believe this. I just don't believe that. I just believe God sees me and he's, he's just going to feel sorry for me. and He's going to take care of me. I, you know, he see, no, God sees you saying, I don't believe you. I'm not going to trust you. And so I'm going to try it my own way. I'm going to lay in the floor for three days crying like a baby. Hope the whole neighborhood calls so I can whine to all of them. Because this is how it's worked in the past. And it had never worked. That's why you still lay in there crying. <laughs> for this is the will of God. Well, let me say something about the will of God. Jesus said not everybody that calls him Lord is going to heaven. But those who do the will of the Father. Those who do do the will of the Father. You see, there is a doing. We're not saved by doing, but once we're saved, there is doing. This is the will of God, specifically your sanctification. That you should abstain from fornication. That means Anything that tries to pull you away from Calvary. Anything that tries to point you away from the cross. Anything. Whether it be TV. Anything. That every one of you. How many? The preachers and the elders and the deacons. I don't say that. Every one of you should know how. Now, remember, this is the Lord. This ain't just a man writing a letter to the Thessalonians. This is Thessalonians, whatever they are. We're the Cass Countyans, I guess. Bowie Countyans. This is, this is God speaking through Paul to me and you. Paul might have never known that this book to this church was going to make it to this church. But God did. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification. So that means every Christian is without excuse. It is God's will that we all know how to possess our vessel, our body. In, it can only be, listen, it can only be possessed correctly in sanctification. That's where it's possessed correctly. That's where the upright walk takes place. That's where, that's where God is pleased. That's where we abound in sanctification. Are we getting that out of the word tonight? I'm not twisted. I'm not adding. This is all in context. If we don't know how to possess our vessel in sanctification, then we cannot walk right. We cannot live right for God. He cannot be pleased, and we cannot abound in the things of the Lord. And it is the Christian's foremost desire to abound in this thing called salvation. That is the Christian's desire, is to please God. That's why, that's, I mean, that is, if you think about it, that's why we got off track. We wanted to please God so much, we were like Abraham. I'm a, I'm a, I got to help God here. I got to do this. And it took us years to, for God to be able to get us in a place where we were so low, we, we, we just gave up and said, God, I don't understand anything anymore. I, all I know is this one thing, that you love me, period. I don't know about tongues anymore. I don't know about any of the gifts. I don't, I don't know nothing. I remember that day for me. I don't know nothing anymore. I'm confused. I'm disturbed. I'm ripped up all I know, and I believe it, that you love me. And God began to teach me what he did to prove that. God began to teach me what he did to show me that he loved me. To be able to impart that love to me is through what his son did at Calvary. He began to show me that in that old warehouse down the road. Praise God. Every one of us should know how to possess our vessel in sanctification and not. Everybody say not. 
not in the lust of concupiscence, which simply means covetousness and wrong fleshly desires. Sinful ways. That's all that big crazy word means. Look it up when you get home. Even as the Gentiles which know not God. See, that, there, see there's that word know again. I love talking about that word know. Because knowing God is attached to Calvary. The Bible says in John 17, 3, this, it, it, it defines eternal life. This is eternal life that they know the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. Do you see what God says there is eternal life? Knowing him and his son that he sent, that is eternal life. The knowledge of God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. Yet Jesus told Nicodemus you can't enter the kingdom you can't even see it till you're born again and the born again experience requires faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ the shed blood so we see we can't know God without faith in Jesus and what he did at Calvary because the Bible says in Ephesians 2 13 it was the blood that drew us near that's why God wants the gospel, the message of the cross, preached. Because every time, it's, every time it's ministered, I don't care what it looks like, I don't care how it ends, he was reaching in that. He was drawing in that. I don't care where it's at. I don't care if it's around the lost or among the saved. Every time the gospel is preached, he is drawing people. They may not come, but he is drawing them. If he be lifted up, I will draw how many men? All men. Now, understand, that helps us to understand, even when folks ain't coming, that don't mean he ain't drawing. He was drawing us before we ever surrendered and came. Hallelujah. Because that gospel was being preached. I don't care what it looks like. He, he cannot lie. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. Why do you think God's giving these ministers, these internet ministries and radio and television ministries? Because God wants to reach everybody. He wants to reach out there and snatch every living soul and pull them into who he is. But you know who's, who he's going to be able to use? Only the ones who know how to possess their vessel in sanctification. Ain't nobody else going to get used by God. They can lay there and cry every Monday night for 40 years, and I'm sorry, that's all they're going to get out of it. They're going to have a rude awakening when they want a low treasure reward for that because they ain't getting none. Only in sanctification come the life, come the movement, come the stirring, come the power, come the change. In sanctification. So if, if now I done said enough. If, 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 if what we need is in sanctification, now we understand a little bit better why the Lord wants us to learn a little bit more about sanctification. Because that is what the big to-do is about the message of the cross. Oh, I understand when I heard it. Oh, I, I knew that. I knew that when I got saved. I, that was where I started. But I didn't understand it for this word, sanctification. My movement, the activity of God in my life now. Him moving me and using me and changing me. And if we're going to find a church alive, we're going to find a church that's in the sanctification process. Or we're going to find a dead, complacent, I don't care how good the music is, I don't care how much the preacher hollers, if it ain't the message of the cross, honey, there ain't no sanctification. There ain't the first hint of it. It can't happen. It's all make-believe and religion, psychology, the wisdom of man. We can't do anything without Jesus. Every one of us should know how to possess our vessel in sanctification and not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Now, I got a couple of statements here I wrote, and I, I want to read them. Gentiles who do not know God cannot walk in the sanctification process as their faith is not in the word of the work of the cross of Christ. Let me say that again. The word of the work of the cross of Christ. You see, that's what this Bible is about. The word of the work of the cross of Christ. That's what this Bible is about. It's not about anything else. Preachers say, well, it's more about money in there. This Bible's not about money. This Bible's about the riches of God's grace in His Son, Jesus. 
not the riches of dollars in our pocket. And also, Christians have to learn how to walk and please God and to abound therein through faith in God's word of the work of the cross of Christ. God continues to confirm to me what he told me several months ago on this platform or sometime last year, maybe even early, early last year, if not the year before, but I'll never forget it. He said, no one, nobody has a word from me to you if it does not pertain to my son and his sacrifice. And boy, you walk away with words like that and you think, well, was that God? Is that God? I mean, somebody might come up and try to prophesy to me and tell me something, give me direction or something, correction, instruction, and it may not be about Jesus. And the Lord kept saying, no, if it's from me, it's going to be about my son. Because in these last days, ain't like it was in days past. I spoke through the prophets, but in these last days, I'm speaking by my son. Are you learning of my son? And then just last weekend, the Lord shows up. Sitting on my couch. I like it when he shows up when I'm on my couch. But he said, Jesus said, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then he told me, we don't live at all unless we taste of his son's flesh and drink of his blood. And then he told me this, every word out of my mouth you're called to live by is going to pertain to my son and what he did at Calvary. Every word out of the mouth of God can be somehow related back to the Lamb of God. Whether we can relate it, I don't care. Whether we can understand it, I don't care. But I have that revelation now that every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Jesus said we could live by, but he also said you can't live unless you taste my flesh and drink my blood. So that lets me know God's telling us every word that God speaks is going to be about the lamb in some way, form, or fashion. And you've got to be that narrow-minded to keep making it to the end. You've got to be determined to be that narrow-minded. When the devil shows up and whispers to you and says, hadn't you had enough of this cross stuff? Yeah, I'm just going to say, I ain't even started yet. I ain't even got started good yet. Praise God for the blood. I, I like my little old picture on my message of the sanctification. See my little pile of dirt right here where we came out of? And then there's a little seed popped up. And then it starts growing, turns into a beautiful flower. That's us. We cry out for years, God, I just want to be like you. I just, Lord, I want to grow. But if we don't know how, he can't do it. He won't do it. There is a way. It's in sanctification. There is a way, and it's in sanctification. And we're going to learn what that means. We're going to get into this. We're going to get deep. But I'm going to tell you, it's all going to be shallow. It might be deep at first, but what you thought was deep water one time, you just started swimming in, didn't you? You remember a little kid when you waited? Oh, it's deep, Daddy. Hold me. Wasn't long. You say, Daddy, why are you trying to hold me? I can swim. What we once thought was deep becomes shallow. Mm. My goodness. I want to read something. If you'll turn to John 17, I want to cover this before we quit. John 17. This is an it's a, it's a it's a important scripture concerning this particular subject of sanctification. John seventeen. Where am I at? John seven. Come on, bud. John seventeen, seventeen. This is Jesus praying, and by the way, this is the prayer of Jesus, not Matthew six. That's our prayer. 
We call Matthew 6 the Lord's Prayer. That's not the Lord's Prayer. That's the prayer he told us to pray. The Lord's Prayer is right here in John 17. And this is what he prayed, part of what he prayed in verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctification is only found in the truth. And he says, thy word is truth. So we understand here what the truth, who the truth is and what the truth is. Who, Jesus, what makes him our truth is what he did at Calvary. Because Jesus taught in John 8, 32, I believe it was, that when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Romans 6, 7 says, he that is dead is free. You see how that's rightly dividing the word of God. He that is dead is free from sin. Christ died for us. He is the truth. He died for us so we could be free from sin. And when our faith is placed in him, we are free from sin because we die from sin with him. We become dead to sin and alive unto God. Are you with me? You see how the scriptures can be rightly divided. So there's something about Jesus that makes him our truth. It's the cross. It's not a tree. It's not a stick. It's what he did. What he did to us there. What he did to the devil there. What he did to please the Father there. It's his, it's his activity, his performance, that work that he accomplished and finished. The work of the cross. His death. When we talk about the blood, we're talking about death. If you would have stood there that day and his blood would have covered you from head to toe, it wouldn't have done a thing for you. Nothing. But faith, that is the son of the living God. Now that gets you in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Jesus said, he's praying to the Father, I got moves for you. If Jesus is asking for the Father for something for us, you're going to get ready. Sanctify them. It's God's will. His son prayed to him and asked, sanctify, sanctify Curtis. Sanctify Curtis. Through your truth. Thy word is truth. Here we are back to the blood, the cross, what Jesus did, and every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. Here we are again seeing that we're sanctified through the truth, and the truth is Jesus and what he did at Calvary. You can't move away from the cross. You can't. If you're in the faith, you cannot move away from the cross. If you do, you've moved away from the process. No daily cross, no sanctification. That'd have been, that would have been number 11. Case ain't that big. But every message we preach, whatever the topic it is, there is whatever the benefit that we're trying to show that you can have from God today through Christ, you cannot have it without faith in the cross. You can have it if you'll take up your cross today, which means simple faith in what he did for you, not you going and buying something like that hanging on the wall and dragging it through the parade on the 4th of July. I'm dragging my, I'm, I'm carrying my cross. That ain't it. Jesus, look at this. Let's, let's go ahead and read verse 18. As you have sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. Who? The ones who are sanctified. Only the ones who are sanctified. Now we see in verse 19, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself. How did he do that? He went to the cross. He set himself apart for the work of God. What was the work of God? The will of God on his life. He had a commandment. You will give your life for the sins of the world. Jesus said he had that commandment of the Father. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. You see, here's a revelation, him sanctifying himself, dying on the cross. It is the truth. It sanctifies. Nothing else does. You see, God is the, and we'll see it later sometime, but God is the sanctifier. 
He's the justifier. He's the redeemer. He's our everything. We have nothing to offer him except a heart of belief. I'm just going to believe you. Man, I, I, I just believe the Lord's going to teach us some powerful things through this. Those that want to learn are going to learn. And here's the, here's the effect of learning change. The effect of learning is always change. The, the disciples had to change every day as they followed Jesus. They were, I believe with all my mouth, the disciples had to carry lots of water with them because their mouths were dry because they hung open all the time. I believe that. Their mouths hung open. If we walked with Jesus on the earth, our mouths would hang wide open. Did you, did you, did you see that? Did you started when he was a boy, 12-year-old boy. He's teaching old 90-year-old men. And they're like, are you hearing this? Are you hearing this? Give me a drink, man. This kid's got me dry. It's the effect of learning is change. Peter didn't stop following Jesus when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Why didn't he turn away? Because he had a revelation, you the one. You can't run me off. You can't run me off. You, Lord, you can discipline me. You can, do, you can call me the devil, but you can't run me off. Now, I want us to look at this again. I'm, I'm quitting. I got 30 seconds. Let's, let's take, make every second count. Verse 19 says, Jesus did it for us. He did it for you. He did it for us. For their sakes, I sanctify myself. And we're going to learn in this, this series here that sanctification really is just another word for holiness. Holy. That's what it is. Those two words are synonymous. They're the same. And we'll, and we'll bear that out. We'll see that. The Lord will show us that as we move through these scriptures. But I want to, as I close, I want us to see this in verse 19. It was for us. He did it. He sanctified himself. He went the distance. He did not back away when I believe that any other man on the earth would have quit. Any other man. I don't believe Kenneth Copeland and all the lies they tell about if they'd have had the revelation Jesus had, they could have been the one. Let me tell you something. Kenneth Copeland didn't come from heaven. Jesus did. Hey. There ain't but one that came from heaven born of a virgin, and it was the living word who'd been there forever. Can't another man hold that spot. Jesus did it for me. When you wake up every morning, you ought to say, thank you. You did it all for me, and you did it all by dying for me. For the, I, I like making this personal. And for your sake, Curtis, I sanctified myself. That you might be sanctified through the truth. So this tells us two or three things. He did it for us. He did it. He did it. He did it for us. And it was the truth that he accomplished there as the truth of God. Not only was he the truth, he accomplished and fulfilled and finished the work of truth on the cross. And he did it for us. But he says that they also might be a part of what I'm about to do. He was thinking about you, Brother Ken. Gwen. I want you to know the Lord is not a God who just created billions of people and know they're there. He knows every hair on the top of your head. I'm not talking about he just can if he wanted to. He knows everything. He made you. He put you here. God has never had a day where he said, oh, who's that one? We're talking about a God who created. He's the one I've told you this before. Your daddy didn't put you in your mama's womb. God did. He just used the man to do it. But I'm going to tell you, lots of men and women have tried to have babies. God determines who's going to have a kid. Because the Bible says we're fearfully and wonderfully made by him. I got a feeling this is going to be some good stuff coming up in the days ahead. It's something that's we have got to know what this means more than a one phrase line. We, the Lord wants to teach. When he, what he, why he's teaching us like he is is because he wants you grounded and settled. Hallelujah. 
to where when the wind blows, you ain't moving from this rock. You won't climb down off this rock and say, I, I just can't take it. Lord, I'm going to get blown off. You cannot be blown off the rock. There ain't a wind that can blow you off the rock. You have to let go. You have to get off of it. Can no storm blow you off the rock. You have to say, I'm out of here. You need to picture that in your mind some different way. The winds are just, the wind, no. It ain't the wind that will blow you off the rock. It's your lack of faith. Your lack of endurance, trusting in the Lord. We better quit. Y'all stand. Lord, I just want to praise you tonight for this process. This, Lord, we call it all sorts of things, but you've called it sanctification. You, you sanctified us on the cross. But you're teaching us how to walk in that sanctification, how to possess our vessel in the sanctification that you've already set us apart as a part of. I thank you, Lord, for the word of the Lord. I thank you for the encouragement, the conviction, the strength, the comfort, and the wisdom. Not only that you've given us in days past, but even on this very night and in the days ahead, God, that we would seek your face more than ever so before that we wouldn't think well we've learned a lot that's that'll hold us Lord what we've learned is great and we're so thankful for it but God our hearts cry out for more and not just to hear something new Lord God but that what we would hear would benefit us and cause your name to be magnified and glorified through these lives these vessels that you call your own temple Lord, that we would learn of you and be changed, that we would walk in this way, God. You call it the way, the way, your son Jesus, who is our sanctification, who was made unto us our holiness, our sanctification. All the days of our life, Lord, we pray that we would never stop learning never stop changing being conformed into the image of your son Jesus God we don't ever just want to hear new knowledge without a result for you have told us we should grow in the knowledge and the grace of your son Jesus Christ and as you teach us Lord I know that if we believe then you will perform for you are our grace at work you are our grace you give us knowledge we believe and you work on our behalf and we find ourselves walking in the very works that you ordained in Christ from the foundation of the world I thank you for this word tonight I thank you for hungry hearts and I thank you for the word of the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. I thank you for a people who you have caused in these last few minutes of this thing called time as we know it now to be determined, set apart, sanctified with the fruit of holiness in our lives. God, we ask you to have your way. We ask you to have your way and whatever the needs are in this place tonight that you would show up as Jehovah Jireh even on this day Lord we know you've already provided all that we need but Lord I know that some need a manifestation of that tonight some need a miracle some need something tonight and I pray that you'd show up and show yourself strong on their behalf let them see that your strength is made perfect in their weakness and may they find themselves boasting in their knowledge of you. Declaring that they would rather just keep glorying in the mess that they may be in. In the weakness and the infirmities that they might have. Just as long as the power of Christ continues to rest upon them. We thank you for a mighty hand of deliverance tonight, oh God. We thank you for building your church and teaching your church the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. We ask you for revival in this entire region, Lord God.
revival among your people. That you would deliver them from the fear of the fear of man and bring them back to the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. If you need prayer tonight, I want you to come quickly. Let us pray for you. If you need anything at all, come believe in God. He's faithful. He can do anything. He can do anything at all. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He's already provided. Already provided. There you go. That's it right there. He's already provided. Thank you, Lord. Everything you need, He's already provided. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Every promise you can claim, just have. multiplied grace in his life. That you would open those doors, Lord God, for whatever it is that may be needed here, God. But then I know you're drawing him closer and closer. He's Teaching, providing, not just hearing the word, but learning the word. And, and, and being conformed into your very image. Learning the fellowship of your sufferings, the power of your resurrection. I praise you for what you're doing in Carlisle's life, Lord. I thank you how you, Lord, just miraculously brought him here. Just popped out of nowhere, it seems like, God. Here, and we know he came from where he came. But, God, here he is in a place, God, he would have never dreamed of being. You doing things in his life that he would have never been able to write down and, and, and figure it out in another school. But I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Every step of the way, you've been faithful, Lord. That's all you can be, Lord, is faithful. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in his life and Cherry's life. And, Lord, I know you're going to open doors, God, in the days ahead. Doors that they can't open doors that they're going to walk through and be able to see you at work in their lives. Lord, I just pray, God, that you would let them hang on to you. Let them hang on to you and let them be patient and waiting on you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Everything. He's already provided. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank you, Lord, that you've already provided. Teach us to find that. Teach us to believe that. Teach us to walk in that which has already been provided. For we know you've given us all spiritual blessings, that you will not withhold any good thing from those that walk uprightly before you. So the problem is not on your end of us not having what it is we think we need today. The problem's on this end. Teach us, O oh Lord. Teach us that we might hear, that we might learn, that we might just be content in that you've called us godly people, the children of God, and that you're not ashamed to be called our God. Hallelujah. Use us in these last days, oh God, even beyond our years, Lord, that we've lived. Use us, Lord. Give us wisdom beyond our years. Teach us to walk in this truth, this sanctification process, this way of your son Jesus bless us oh God bless us Lord bless our marriages, bless our children bless every avenue of ministry under this roof God reach far and wide through every man, woman and child in this house God hallelujah Lord I pray that you would increase the listeners that hear what's coming out of this house all over the world, God. That you would increase, God. For we know that your church needs to hear 
the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. We bless the Lord. Can I say tonight that the Lord has surely caused his countenance to shine upon you? Without a shadow of a doubt, his countenance shines upon each one of us in this place. He's chosen to do that because he loves us. What I see when I see the people of God who are believing this truth, I see his light, his glory. I don't see a bunch of different colors, a bunch of different, all I see is the glory of God. I'm talking about Him. As we leave this place tonight, I want you to know you've got the victory. You know the way. Jesus told His disciples, where I'm going, you know, and you know the way. You already know the way. Hallelujah. So let's walk it out. And even though it's an individual walk, we can fight this good fight as those God has placed here strategically together. For an army is not an army of one, but an army. And God strategically places men, women, and children together for His purpose. The Bible declares that He places us us in the body where it pleases Him. He's pleased that we've gathered together in His name. And services like this is when the word of the Lord comes forth is how God begins to join us together. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That don't mean quit coming to church, really. It means don't forsake the way God assembles His people together, which is a part of coming to church and hearing the word of the Lord. Don't forsake that assembly process. That sanctification process. Don't don't run away from God trying to change and build. Because it's only because He wants His light to shine brighter through us than ever before. That's exciting. It's not always easy. I don't know if it's ever easy. But it's a promise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I love you, Brother Jerry. You're doing a good job on that camera. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you're watching by internet, God bless you. We'll see you Sunday morning at Friday morning at 8 a.m. And right here again at 10 a.m. Sunday morning. Tune in. Tell the neighborhood to watch. Glory to God.